Another edition of Humor Talks, where I talk with uh, different thought leaders on humor in the workplace and extensions from that. Today we're going to be talking to Paul Smith. He is the Director of Consumer Research at P&G, but also the author of Lead with the Story, which has been featured in Forbes, Time, CIO, and uh, other places as well. How are you doing today, Paul? Very good. Good to talk to you. Excellent. Uh, so, Paul, you and I shared a, a training stage a couple of years ago at uh, Procter & Gamble, and I was there talking about leadership and uh, humor, and you were there talking about leadership kind of through storytelling. So, uh, you've also written a book called Lead with a Story, which I've started to, to read, and I think it's fantastic. But tell us a little bit, what's the idea behind uh, Lead with a Story? Yeah, well, and and I was glad to meet you there. The, the unfortunate thing is I didn't get to stay and uh, and hear your stuff. So uh, so I think you owe me one actually. Somehow. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I do. Catch up with you. Um, Absolutely. But, you know, the idea behind the book is, uh, so, I mean, the title is "Lead with a Story," and we're here talking about storytelling. But but first and foremost, it's a book on leadership, and storytelling is just the vehicle, and it's an admittedly unlikely vehicle. But uh, but the book is about how to make you a better leader and all of and all that that entails, um, you know. And I could probably help you understand it better by telling you what it's not, because it's been confused uh, by some folks just based on the title. They'll they'll think, oh, so so this is a book that's basically trying to tell me if I've got a big sales presentation or some big meeting and I've got to give a speech or something that I need to lead off with a story or a joke or something like to break the ice. And that's not at all what I'm talking about. I'm talking about using storytelling to actually deliver your leadership message um, and to affect the, the change that you want, not as some kind of a, a lead-in or a cheesy icebreaker or some afterthought later. I'm actually talking about using storytelling to replace the normal management speak <laughs> that we would right. engage in in the office to be more effective. Yeah, and I think that's uh, incredibly powerful. There's uh, this element of sometimes with humor in the workplace or doing things a little, di a little bit differently. People are like, oh, well, yeah, I'll just tell a random joke that has no relevance to what it is I'm talking about, breaking the ice, which there's a little bit of value to, I think. But you're talking about that next level of using storytelling as, yeah, again, really telling your message that it's directly tied in and doesn't seem kind of just, out of uh, left field in terms of the audience of like, why would they say that about this whole thing? It's like, no, it's a story that actually gives credibility. And so what was kind of the, how did you come to find this idea of um, the power of story? What got you into, you know, getting to the point that you're like, you know what, I need to write a book about this? Yeah, so I, I guess maybe I'm a slow learner. I've, I've been working at P&G for 20 years now, and it probably took me 15 to realize that storytelling was an important uh, skill that I needed to have. And I guess I, I just finally realized after identifying the leaders at, at, at that company and others that I admired, that I wanted to be like, um, you know, when I grew up in the company or, or the ones that I wanted to work for. If I, if I looked at those people and I tried to decide what they had in common, their, their ability to tell a compelling story was one of those things. And it dawned on me that they didn't teach me that in business school, <laughs> you know, so I wasn't really prepared for that skill set. And so I set about, you know, learning everything I could about it, and I, I, I bought and read all the books I could find on the subject, and and I left even with an even stronger conviction that I needed to know how to do this well, but still didn't know how to do it. And and that's when I realized, well, if I if I want to know this, probably some other people – do as well. So that's I said. If I can't find the book that I'm looking for, I'm just going to have to write it because somebody needs to. And and so what what I ended up putting in it were were the two things that I couldn't find in any of the other books. And the first one is really how do you tell a good business story? Because it's, mm -hmm. that's very different than you know the way you would write a screenplay for a Hollywood movie or write a, a romance novel. I mean those are stories too, but they're mm -hmm. a they're much longer, but they're just different. And so I tried to to write a book that would actually teach people how to do it, and that's one thing that was missing from all the others. But the other thing was I just I needed a bunch of stories, and as I as I interviewed people, 
um, senior leaders at a bunch of companies, and I, I tried to find out why are people not using storytelling more often. The, the thing I found out was, uh, first of all, most of them don't realize they should be telling stories. But even the ones that do, the main reason they don't tell more stories is they just don't have any to tell. Mm -hmm. And so that's the other thing I wanted my book to do would be to give you a 100 stories that you can actually use. So not, not just as an example of, hey, here's an example of how you can use a story in a business setting. You know, if that's all I wanted to do, the book would have been very, very short. Right. Um, I actually wanted to give people, and here are these 20 or 21 leadership challenges. Here are five or six stories that you could use in each of these leadership challenges, and you could actually use the same story yourself to, to successfully navigate that situ situation. So it was a way to jumpstart people's personal collection of stories that they need to add up upon, but I wanted to give them a place to start. Yeah, and I think that's what I really appreciate about the book as someone that is like, yeah, I want to get in and do this. As I'm going through it, I, I love, you know, multiple elements of it. First, that, you know, you tell the power of story and talk about its benefits, but you go beyond that and you help those people that are like, yeah, if I wanted to start to do this, they have direct examples that they can use in terms of here's a perfect story on leadership in this uh, kind of this situation. But then you also help through the process help to train people how to create their own stories or the elements of a good story so that if they have their own kind of personal thing that they think they can relate to it, they start to have these new kind of guidelines to do it. So I think it's really helpful in terms of actually getting people to do the storytelling. And to your point, you know, people, why don't people use storytelling? Well, they don't have examples or they don't know how. And so I think this covers uh, the mold for that. Uh, which Thank I think you. Is That's great. the idea. Very cool. So um, what are some of the ways – so we talked about it as a, a leadership um, kind of as helping to provide leadership, but what are some of the, the direct benefits that you notice? You know, you, you do it and use it at Procter & Gamble. What are the, the reasons that people are like, you know what, yeah, we, we want to use story? Uh, what are the things that it helps with? Yeah, well, it, it helps because you can't just order somebody to – be more creative <laughs> or start <laughs> loving your job or get more inspired, <laughs> right, or right. Uh, work more smarter or collaboratively or be a better problem solver or, you know, <laughs> you know, Drew, what you really need to do, you need to think outside the box more. You know, <laughs> if you just start doing that, you, you, you'd be a, a great employee. Like mm -hmm. you just can't tell people to do those things because the human brain doesn't work that way. You have to – Show them, and a story is the best way to show them. You show them how somebody else was creative or tell them a story that will help them appreciate and love their job more or tell them an inspiring story that will inspire them or tell them a story about how somebody else was thinking outside of the box and it can show them how to. You just can't order people to do stuff that involves the creative part of their brain because you, mm -hmm. the, humans don't respond to that. The stories, stories can do that. Yeah, yeah, that element of inspiration, I think, is really powerful with the, the right story. It gives you this kind of feeling of emotion that kind of, like, comes up that, pe like, certain stories really evoke, can invoke and inspire change, certainly. So what are the, the pieces or elements that make a story great and make it relevant to the corporate world? Yeah, so there's there's about a handful of things I think that are really important. Probably the most important two. Um, the first one is the structure of a story, mm -hmm. and and I, I do think stories have structure. And I hear people tell stories in the wrong with the wrong structure or in the wrong order all the time, and it really makes for a much more uh, a, a poor story. And so there, there really is a beginning, a middle, and an end to the story, and that's part of what I try and take the reader through is to help them understand. You know, what's the context, where, what's the action of the story, and what's the result? And if you tell it in a different order, it just doesn't have the same impact. So the structure is one thing. The second most important thing, I think, is emotion. Um, if, if your story doesn't have some kind of emotional element, and, and I don't mean a, a tearjerker and you need to have your, your coworkers in tears, but because it, it doesn't have to be sadness. It could be joy. It could be greed. It could It could be happiness. It could be... Um, empathy. In fact, empathy is the, the best emotion for a business story that I can think of. Um, if you don't have some element of emotion in it, it's probably not a story. It's probably a case study or an example or an anecdote or it's something else, but it's not 
a story. So those are the two most important ones, but there are some others that you could use to make a good story into a great uh, story, like um, the element of surprise and using metaphors and analogies. And, you know, I'll tell you, there's one that I left out, and I left it out. I think it's important, and mm -hmm. I'll admit that the reason I left it out, and it's one that, that you know more about than anybody I know, and it's mm -hmm. humor. And yeah. I admit to you that I didn't leave it out because I didn't think it was important, but honestly because I didn't know how to do it. Or, or I, I mean, I'll tell stories and they'll end up being funny, but I don't know why they were funny because I'm not a humorist. And yeah. and it's it's of all of these things, it's the hardest thing. And and you you know this better than any. It's the hardest thing to teach somebody else to do. And that's because I don't really know. When I've said something funny, I really don't know why it was mm -hmm. funny. It just gets a laugh. And so humor is a, definitely an important part of storytelling, but I didn't feel like I could teach it adequately. So I just, quite frankly, left it out. And maybe maybe that's your job then is to write that chapter. Absolutely, and yeah, maybe to, to pick up because I do think that it's, it's an important element. And I think one of the things that I talk about as I talk about humor is that um, to me humor is a little bit of a broader definition. I was actually just talking with um, – a group from Peppercom who does, uh, they go in and they do stand-up comedy as part of a training session for various corporate workplaces, and it's a way to improve morale and do, it's a big team-building event because people are kind of scared and intimidated, but they, they teach people how to do stand-up, and I've done, um, you know, comedy boot camps and stuff like that in the past that I've taught, and one of the big differentiations that we make is that humor is about making people smile, and comedy is about making people laugh, so humor is a little bit broader of a context, and so just making people smile, doing things a little bit differently, um, things that are incongruous or absurd or comic, kind of that cause amusement is, is the definition behind humor. So that's, I think, part of it is that you don't always have to make people laugh, but a lot of it comes from, um, I think, to what you kind of mentioned, structure in terms of uh, when people are surprised, if you give them a, a basically in a formal joke of a setup and punchline, you are setting up a certain expectation, and then the punchline breaks that expectation, and that's what causes people to laugh. They're going in one direction, and then they're surprised, and they, they laugh as a result. And the other element is that emotion. I think that sometimes we laugh just because we've been in that situation before. We feel the truth of, uh, in comedy in terms of um, what you're expressing on Stage. And I think that a lot of times if people are putting those things in there already, if they have structure and they have that emotion that you talk about, they'll reach some of the, the funny parts naturally. And to your point, they may not know why, but I do think that's an important element um, uh, or can be a powerful element of humor is getting people to, uh, to laugh intentionally or unintentionally, but being there to, um, to embrace it. That makes sense. Yeah, I wish I'd known that. I'd, I had one more chapter in my book. <laughs> Um, yeah, so maybe the, the future extension version, we'll, we'll talk uh, more of that. So how has it been uh, received? Obviously, it seems like it's gone well in terms of the ideas and concepts in the book. It's been talked about in Forbes and all these other places, and that you do trainings at P&G and do speaking elsewhere and stuff. So it seems like it's something that people um, are starting to believe in. Have you found that that's been true? People are seeing the value of story. Yeah, in fact, it's uh, it, it's exceeded my expectations. Like I said, I I, I really mostly wrote the book for me, um, but I'm I'm finding that a lot of other people are appreciating it as well. And 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 to be fair, I I think I'm in the middle, or um, hopefully not the end of, but in the middle of a a revival of storytelling, of appreciation and practice of storytelling that really started about 20 years ago, and really picked up about 10 years ago. So um, so I'm, I'm benefiting from some of that momentum in the business world. Um, and, yeah, and yeah, it's showing. I think the book's in its third printing already, and it's been published in uh, Korea, and it'll be in, uh, published in Japanese next month and in Indonesia later in the year. And so um, it, it's not just a local phenomenon as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased with, with that kind of uh, uptake. Yeah, I think that that's, uh, that's great. And you're right, even as a performance storytelling is getting, you know, has had a revival just with kind of the moth here in New York City and um, great storytellers like Mike Birbiglia and stuff are, are getting more you notoriety know, and moving maybe some away from stand-up comedy where it's just about laughter. And I think story, the other element of story that is maybe not there in other forms of humor, even performance in terms of straight comedic is that 
you have the opportunity to go a little bit more serious, to kind of make a point. And I think sometimes those rises and fall in a story can be incredibly impactful. If you're making people laugh a lot through these stories and then you hit a moment that's kind of a little bit more poignant or a little bit more serious in nature in terms of, oh, this is when I had a really tough time or this was me going through a transformation or when a leader really stepped up or didn't step up, those stories can, they're emotional lately, they leave an impact on us. And I think kind of to your point earlier, they leave an impact more on us than uh, just kind of telling a random joke or even just kind of going through the normal training and this is a way to replace some of those elements that you would normally speak about. Right. Um, very cool. So uh, I guess, uh, do you have a favorite story to tell? Oh, yeah. yeah you know, um, my favorite story is actually not one that's in the book. And in fact, I, I wouldn't even call it a a, a, a business story. But since mm -hmm. you asked, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> it's Excellent. Actually, yeah. No, it's that's actually what about my hear. father. Yeah, it's actually about my dad. And, and uh, when I when I was probably 17 years old, um, he helped me get a job at the company that he worked at, and I, I was a file clerk basically in the personnel office. Um, and uh, that's when I learned about Secretary's Day. Now, they probably don't call it that these days. It's probably mm -hmm. Administrative Professionals Day or something, but this was 30 years ago, right? So um, so on Secretary's Day, everybody, uh, all the secretaries, me being one of them, got taken out to lunch by their boss. And they apparently, since there were so many of us at this company in this little small town, they basically rented out the local one of the local restaurants just for this day for this all of us at this one company. So here was a, you know, a hundred managers and a hundred secretaries in this uh, in this restaurant for lunch. And so to prepare for that, they basically had to prepare the food so that there was only two options for lunch when you got in there. And one was a club sandwich, and one was a quiche Lorraine. Now this was back in like 1980. Six or seven, and uh, you may not be old enough to remember this, but there was a book that had just come out a few years earlier called "Real Men Don't Eat Quiche," <laughs> and it basically was a book making fun of the feminization of the American male. And it was a tongue-in-cheek book, but it was highly popular, and so basically, no, you know, self-respecting man after that book came out would dare eat quiche because it would brand him as a sissy or something, right? Mm -hmm. So and everybody had either read the book or heard the book, heard of the book. So here we are, and I'm 17 years old, and obviously, you know, still questioning my own, you know, manhood and all that kind of stuff. So when the waitress comes around to me, of course, I very quickly order the club sandwich, as did every other male in the the place, mm. uh, and most of the women were ordering the quiche Lorraine. Well, it gets around to my dad, so so my dad's in the same company, he's in the same room, and he's at the same table that I'm at. Mm -hmm. um, with his secretary, and it gets around to him, and he says, well, you know, I've never had a quiche, so how about this? How about you bring me a half a quiche and a half a club sandwich? That way, if I don't like the quiche, I still got my club sandwich. Mm -hmm. And all the men at the table immediately start making fun of him and basically questioning his masculinity in, in, in terms that I won't repeat on this family-friendly mm -hmm. show. And, of course, okay. embarrassing the heck out of me as his son sitting there, and I'm just you know terrified. Anyway, after like two or three minutes of all the ribbing he can take, he finally calls the waitress back over. And, of course, that just sends the guys like howling with you know high fives. And like they had, they had won, right? They had beaten right. him into submission. And he calls the waitress back over and he says, I'm sorry. I, I need to change my order. I, I ordered a half a club sandwich and a half a quiche. And I need you to take back that half a club sandwich, and I want you to bring me the whole damn quiche. And, and there was silence at the table, and all their draws, their, their um, jaws like dropped. And I, I, to this day, I don't know if my dad actually likes quiche, but I can tell you on that day, he ate every bite of that quiche with a smile on his face. And and you know, he probably didn't intend to do this, but you know, I learned a lesson that day about what it means to be a man or to be an adult in general, a free thinking adult, and about not caring what other people think and standing up for what you believe in and not being, you know, ridiculed into submission and he didn't intend to teach me all those lessons mm -hmm. but man he did and my respect for my father was never higher than at that moment um and so to this now today here it is 30 years later and I've got two two boys of my own 13 and 8 years old and I tell them that story when I see them being influenced by their peers to do something that they don't want to do just to remind them that a real man doesn't do that. You know, you do, mm -hmm. you you do what you think is the right thing to do, and I just find it an incredibly 
helpful story. Um, and like I said, that that's not a, a business story, but the stories I tell at work are, are really no different. They're stories about something that happened to somebody, doesn't have to be me, where somebody learned a lesson and that they can learn from that lesson too. And so and that's why I generally share them. But that's one of my favorites. Yeah, no, I think, and I think it's a, a great story because, you know, with your kids or even I think even within a corporate, you know, world, you could go in and the lesson could be, you know, hey, don't get influenced by just because everyone else around you is doing something or don't be influenced by friends, that kind of stuff. You can give kind of that memorized, you know, line of dialogue of what it right. is that you're supposed to say. <laughs> how, but just, how effective would that be? Right, exactly. But the fact that you have this story and you go through emotions and it's like more engaging, so you're like actually listening to it, and then by the end you're like you have that head shaking. Like while you're telling the story, I thought of uh, when I was an intern at uh, PNG. Uh, one of the guys around there sent around this uh, link to this book, uh, which was kind of popular at the time, called "Look at My Strike Shirt," and it was basically a similar kind of tongue-in-cheek type thing of like how. Young professionals uh, wore striped shirts uh, into the workplace, vertical stripes, and just kind of like the – some of the cockiness that went around to it and also how, like, they were so young but didn't really know what was going on or that kind of thing. And at the time, I was wearing a bunch of striped shirts, and uh, unfortunately, I wasn't like your father where I wasn't influenced by that. But, like, right. I guess <laughs> I subconsciously – yeah, like, subconsciously, like, now all of my shirts – and I enjoy it. All of my shirts are solid uh, – colored kind of button up shirt um, and so apparently that just kind of them sitting around that book and kind of joking about it I was like alright well I guess I won't wear striped shirts but uh, while you're telling certain stories you know it evokes images in our head one of being able to sit there and actually you you know I can start to see what it's like with this what was probably like at the rest of the restaurant but I also it brings up my own memories and as a result of that I can easily relate these messages again as opposed to just saying don't do this or do this instead. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's actually a great example of kind of the power of story. Very good. Thank you. I, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, very cool. So um, if people are interested, uh, obviously I'll uh, kind of share the information on, uh, on the book which is uh, available um, online and a couple of other places I'm guessing. Um, where, so where can people go to get the book, I guess, is uh, the question I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, it's it's available just about anywhere you would normally buy your books on, you know, Amazon or Barnes and Noble, all the online places. It's probably in every Barnes and Noble store in the in this country, and um, it's online and most others. So wherever you, wherever your listeners buy books, probably my book would be there. And if they have trouble, they can just go to leadwithastory.com, which is my website, and they can get directed somewhere like that. Okay, great. And then, so do you also do um, other things as well, kind of with, like, so speaking and training and stuff. So if people are really fascinated by this idea of story and stuff, where, they, where can they find more or where can they see more of you? Yeah, so I, I do. And, in fact, uh, as soon as we get off the phone here, I'm headed to the airport to go to Dallas, Texas, where I've got a keynote speech. But so, um, yeah, I do corporate training um, uh, and speaking on this topic to, to teach executives or, or others how to use storytelling effectively at work, and, uh, and you can find all, all of that information and some videos uh, of me on my website uh, to kind of see what that looks like. So thank you for asking. Okay, great. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll certainly share that uh, information. Any uh, any final thoughts or any last things you want to say before we sign off? Well, um, I, I actually just started my, my second book, and um, and I'd, I'd love to know what you think about it because it's very different than the first one but with one uh, one thing in common, and that is story. And so if this, the first book is using storytelling to make you a better leader at work, the next one's going to be using stories to make you a better leader at home. So it's basically like the story I told you about my dad, I'm quite certain mm -hmm. that'll be in there. But it's yeah. it's a collection of stories to help parents teach their kids wisdom as opposed to doing what you were saying, like just wagging your finger at them and telling them, you know, be kind to strangers because that just doesn't mm -hmm. work. So we'll see if we can start a second collection of uh, of more personally useful stories. Yeah, I think that that's, uh, that's great and an important element of that, um, kind of hitting both sides of that work-life balance or work-life efficiency kind of in terms of the, the two things that we spend a lot of our time uh, on in adulthood is, is parenting and work stuff. So I think it's great that you're, uh, you're tackling both. Yeah. Well, Paul, thanks so much for, uh, for joining us today. As I mentioned, I'll kind of share some of the links um, up there. And uh, 
hopefully people are now uh, inspired as well to continue to, to use humor in the workplace with uh, today's example of through, uh, through some storytelling. So thanks so much, Paul. Very good. Thanks for having me.